I am so pleased to present Mr. Corey Gibson. Corey is a VP from DX Engineering. He's going to speak to us tonight on NVIS. You know, NVIS seems to be the way to go for emergency communication. Without further ado, let's turn it over. Corey, take it away. All right. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. Um, you, know, you talk about NVIS being used for emergency communications, and, and that's one of my bullet points I'll get to here really quickly. One of the things that got me into the hobby was emergency communications. I'm into a lot of other things now. I mean, there's a lot of, there's so many aspects of the hobby that are really neat, but the the thought of being able to, you know, just use my radio that sits here and talk all over or anywhere really easily without, you know, a lot of infrastructure, really, that's what drove me into the hobby. So kind of one of those near and dear to the heart type of situations. So um, on that note, I'll go through the uh, the presentation. We'll do some Q&A at the end. A little bit about myself, Corey Gibson, W3JL. I am the design and manufacturing manager at DX Engineering. So I'm in charge of all the research and development, all of the design and all of the production. So all the products that we build that have that DX Engineering name, you know, that's, that's kind of where my fingers go in and I've got a lot of work on. So it's a neat, it's a neat hobby. It's a, it's a great, great thing on this kind of stuff. So, all right. So NVIS antennas and communications, what, what is NVIS? What is this for? So what does it mean? Um, the, the acronym NVIS is near vertical incident skyway. This is a radio signal that has a high takeoff angle. So normally when you're trying to do DX and you're trying to get that signal out as far as you can to talk to Europe or Japan, Japan's probably easier for you guys than it is for me and Europe, you know, I mean, depends on which direction you're going, but you don't want a very high takeoff angle. It just, you know, you're basically burning up the sky, you're sending your signal into space, all of that kind of stuff. Um, for DX, you want that, you know, nice you know, 18, 20 degrees, you go, you hit the you hit the ionosphere, you hit the right layers of the ionosphere, and you skip down and you get that, that long distance. NVIS is great. It has that high takeoff angle. What it gives you is some very reliable communications within a two to 300 mile radius, sometimes longer, sometimes further, but generally a two to 300 mile radius is very reliable. Um, and that's really great for emergency communications, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I've got our local repeater. I can hit the one that I use most of the time. I've got one about 20 miles to the west, one about 30 miles to the east that I use pretty regularly, but that's still some infrastructure, right? So I can get to that 30 mile one and I might be able to get 20, 30 miles past it. So I'm looking at 50 miles, but I'm relying on something else out there. I'm relying on the repeater working. I'm relying on there being power, the tornado or whatever it is, didn't take it out, that kind of stuff. With the NVIS, that two to 300 mile range, all I have is my radio, my antenna, and I've got pretty good coverage there. So that's one of the reasons we find it's really great for emergency communication. So the advantages, NVIS covers an area greater than that of a ground wave signal. And that's because of that height and because of that high takeoff angle, terrain is less of a concern. What does that mean? So we have a 10 meter ground wave net that we do in this area. And since I moved over to work for DX Engineering and I'm now probably 40 miles further west from where I was, I can't get into that net anymore. It doesn't, I just don't have, I'm not making it on ground wave and I'm, I'm in that skip zone. So I just, I can't make that net. But that's only, those guys are only 60, 70, 80 miles away, right? And that's that ground wave signal just doesn't propagate that far. If you have terrain between you and the other station, that ground wave signal is going to get absorbed and not propagate through there as well. With this, you know, we say terrain is less of a concern. It's because we have that high takeoff angle. One of the analogies they said is you spray water at the ceiling. Where does it go? Everywhere all around you, right? So we get that longer distances. We get that distance without a repeater or other infrastructure. So with my NVIS antenna, I set up you know, re repeatedly two to 300 miles all the time. NVIS antennas are really easy to set up. You know, this isn't something that you need a 70 foot tower and you don't have to get that dipole 60, 70 feet up into the trees. You don't want it there. And I'll explain a little bit. I'll show some of the models and some of the things that I've done, you know, just modeling this and figuring this out. That height isn't a concern. 15 feet, 30 feet, that's golden, right? I mean, uh, I have one NVIS antenna I use. Basically, it's a single pole and four wires, and the wires hold the pole up. 
And that's the one I've modeled here. And I'll show that a little bit. That works great. So it's not hard to set it up. It's not like you have to get really high. If you don't have a lot of trees or you don't have anything to get stuff up high, it's really good for that as well. Also really easy to quickly set up in the field. So we talk about NVIS, you know, we say it's really great. It covers this area. You know, we've got these signals that, that go up into the air and they just kind of rain down all around us. People can hear us. And if they're using a similar antenna, we can hear them and it's very reliable. Well, there's also a little bit to do with, you know, propagation, time and frequency. Why do we use what frequencies when we use? So we've got some different nets that we do for our emergency communications around here. They're different nets. Most of ours are on 80 meters, but at different times of the day, it, it's, that's not as reliable. You have to switch frequencies. And this is why. During the day when the sun is out, the E layer of the ionosphere is very densely ionized. The maximum usable frequency of that E layer is usually around 10 megahertz. So this allows that layer to reflect signals less than 10 megahertz, less than 10 megahertz. So we're kind of 60, 40, you know, we're under that. We need to be in that range. The D layer, which is just below the E layer, is there in the morning or during the day, and it absorbs most signals under four megahertz. Oh, okay, so three, you know, 80 meter bands, three megahertz, so it's going to get absorbed, but 10 megahertz and above gets reflected the next layer up. So this is 40 meters. During the day, 40 meters is like the go to band for NVIS, just because in general, it can pass through the D layer, hit the E layer, and come back down. As the sun sets, that maximum usable frequency of the E layer sometimes can, not always, but sometimes drops below the 40 meter band because it's losing that source of ionization. The sun is sitting there and it's pumping all these ions into the, the um, E layer, and that's what's helping us get that reflection. When the sun sets, that goes away, some of that ionization disappears, and that maximum usable frequency can drop. If it drops below, you know, seven megahertz, that E layer is no longer going to reflect 40 meter signals. But it's still, you know, probably six, five megahertz, somewhere in there. But also during the day or at night, the D layer disappears at sunset. So that makes 80 meters where it's unreliable during the day. It's really good at night. So nighttime, 80 meters picks up. There's no D layer. It can still be, you know, reflected by the E layer. Everybody's happy. And that's why we have the two things. What is really neat about this is we see this um, when the time changes here. Our nets are 9 a.m. in the morning on Sundays, and they're on 80 meters. And you can tell when the time changes and the sun's up longer in the summer that 80 meters doesn't work as well. So the, the people I hear on the net kind of shrink a little bit. I don't get out as well, you know, but then I go to 40 and I can pick things up. And then in the winter, when it's dark, I can hear better and it, that range expands. So it's really neat to see. We do these nets weekly. It gives people a chance to, you know, tune their radios, make sure their antenna system's working, making sure there's no, you know, one day I went in and my, my SWR is all out of whack. I'm like, what is going on with my antenna? Tree branch finally grew big enough and was starting to touch the antenna. All right, we got to trim some trees. You know, we were getting some issues there. So that that consistent net that we do gives us a good base on how does the, the time and the, the weather and everything affect where we can reach? Is my antenna in good shape? So if we have an emergency, I've got the ability to communicate, right? At the end of the day, you know, we keep those things tuned and we keep them ready so we can communicate. So what kind of antenna do you need? You know, you're going to do this NVIS. You think it's kind of a neat thing. You want to talk to people all over the place. Um, you know, since this antenna is shooting straight up in the air, if you've got mountains around you or you're down in a valley, it helps you get up out of that zone without needing that line of sight. What kind of antenna do we want for that? Well, there's a lot of different designs. You, you search for NVIS antennas. There's ones they put on cars. There's this. There's all sorts of things. But one of the things I liked is I liked 80 and 40. Those are the two bands that I wanted to focus on. So this antenna modeled it out. It's about 15 foot to the top. The ends are only three feet off the ground. This is not something that's high. I've got one 15 foot mast. I've got a ballon on top and I've got four wires coming off. I've got insulators about three feet off the ground staked out. The antenna actually holds the mast up. I can roll this thing out in about five minutes. 
takes more time to roll the coax out sometimes than it does to actually push the mast up and string the wires out. But it consists of basically a, a full dipole on 40 meters. So 60 some feet on 40 meters. Um, and it's crossed at 90 degrees with 80 meter legs. And I wanted to make those legs about the same length. Could you do full size legs on that? Yes, you can. If you do full size legs on that, you get a little better bandwidth. In general, a full size antenna is usually better. You get a little more efficiency and I'll explain that in a little bit. But that was the general shape I was going for. I've got center loaded coils on this antenna. Didn't wanna put the coils at the end. The ends are really close to the ground. You're gonna get a lot more loss. You put them up near the top, that's a high current area. You also get more loss. So it's it, kind of the center was kind of a sweet spot to put the coils. So this is basically what the antenna looks like. There's the, about a 15 foot mast. You've got four wires coming off. This is the tree that eventually grows into my antenna and I have to trim. Um, and you've got the coils here um, on the 80 meter legs. And I've tried different positions. I've tried to move it and turn it and see how it, how it, how the, reception changes and it's pretty neat it doesn't um the pros of this antenna it's a fairly small footprint i mean 60 by 60 you know is, is still a big area but it's not a huge area it's not that hard to set up this thing collapses down to about five feet with some coils of wire easy to throw in the trunk of a car you know you don't need a truck to carry it around it's portable lightweight the antenna is the support there's no additional guy wire so once you guy the thing out you're good once you tune it, it stays pretty good as long as your soil conditions don't change too much and there's not a lot of other things to interact. Um, probably the biggest con of this antenna, the coils themselves. Coils are always a compromise, right? Uh, it makes you it makes your bandwidth a little more, a little bit narrower on 80. Um, there's no free lunch. One of the things that you learn in antenna design and you learn with radios is, is physics is what physics is, and there's no free lunch. You know, you, you do some things and you can get you know, this, 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 they always say like, what do you want? Here's three, here's three variables, pick two, right? You're going to, if you prove one, you're going to lose something somewhere. And there's sometimes some designs that come out there. Like, wow. That that's really neat. But in this case, these coils are a little bit of a compromise, uh, but they're there to shorten up the antenna. It makes it a nice small footprint. So just to kind of show what this antenna looks like, what does the modeling look like? I got two graphs here of antenna radiation patterns. They're the same antenna and they're just at different heights. So all I did on the first one, I took the antenna that you saw modeled there. I had it up at a quarter wavelength. So I put it up in the air. It's an inverted V, v coming off a tower, same exact antenna, running it at the high end of 80 meters. What do you get? Well, at a quarter wavelength, you get a 21 degree takeoff angle. It's what you kind of would expect from an inverted V or a dipole on that. The beam width is about 27.6 degrees between you know here and here. That's a pretty good DX antenna. That's sending that signal off to get it way out there. Bring that same antenna down, put the top at 15 feet, the bottom of it three feet off the, the ground. Takeoff angle is straight up, 90 degrees. And it's about 138 degree beam width. So, I mean, we're, we're spewing you know, RF from about 45 up through 90 all the way to 45 on the other side. So it's just going straight cone and straight up into the air like all right that that seems to work that's kind of what we're looking for because if we can get that up there hopefully we can reach you know by going 45 to 90 you should be able to hit everything in that range that you're trying to hit so then we're going to go ahead and you know what's the swr look like on this well for 40 meters it's under three or one across the entire band you know it's showing here it starts just under two dips down to about 1.5, comes back up to about 2.5. If you got it like a, a radio with an internal tuner, you can use this across the band, right? No, no issues using this across the band. With these loaded coils on 80, you've got a little bit of a compromise on the, on the uh, bandwidth, right? It's not, you're not going to get the whole 80 meter band. You've got these coils, it's going to narrow that bandwidth down. So when I say 140, kilo, 140 kilohertz of bandwidth, that's the three to one. I'm using three to one SWR because that's about what an internal tuner on a radio, if you wanted to tune it. The two nets I do, um, there's an Aries net and a Racy's net. 
and they're just far enough apart that if I tune the antenna right in the middle, I don't need to use my tuner on either one of them. I'm at like 1.4, 1.5 on each one. So I've tuned it here. You know, my two nets are here and here, and it, it works perfect for those. If I wanted to get on FT8 or something like that down in digital, wanted to do CW, probably going to have to make that antenna a little bit longer, let some of the ends out and, and make it a little bit longer to get that. Not going to be able to get both with the same antenna. So that's the design, right? We sit down, I sit down at a computer and, all right, I'm going to design this thing. I'm going to figure out how to make the coils, what the inductance needs to be. So, okay, with this form, this many wraps, all right, we're going to design that. So then we go ahead, let's build it. Let's, you know, proofs in the pudding, right? Let's build this antenna and see how it works. So when we build it, here's what we end up getting. 40 meters, SWR is under three to one across the entire band actually matches the model pretty well. If you look, actually the SWR looks better. Um, that can be deceiving. Sometimes if your SWR on an antenna gets better over time, that's not a good thing. Remember, a dummy load is one-to-one. -one. <laughs> a dummy load has a one-to-one -one SWR. So this was running, had 100 feet of 8X that wasn't in the model. There is loss in that. Don't forget there's loss in my signal going out to the antenna, but there's also then loss on that reflected signal. So it, I don't see as much reflected power. I put out hundred Watts, well, the antenna doesn't see the hundred Watts and I don't see the full reflection of that three to one back because it's getting turned into heat in that coax. So generally when we model something, once you hook up the antenna, usually you'll see an SWR drop a little bit. Doesn't mean that you, this antenna is obviously better. On 80 meters, once again, I tuned it a little bit higher because the model had it kind of down a little further. I needed it up. We're, we're kind of in what I call the nosebleeds. I think our, our one net's on 3990.5. So there's not much room above us there when we're doing that net. Um, but it's kind of neat. You always love it when, you know, the math matches the real world. When you design something and you think, okay, this is what it should do. Trust me, I've had a lot of things that, okay, this is what it should do. Oh, it didn't do that. But in this case, it worked out really well. So we've got this antenna, you know, we've got these 80 meter coils, we've got them on there, they're compromised, they make the antenna smaller, but what are they really doing to us overall? How much are we losing in them? How does that happen out? I don't know, I mean, if you guys know I me, mean, Easy Nick, it's the software I use. Uh, I bought it years ago, I loved it. It is now free, uh, Easy Nick 7 is free. It is a great piece of software. There's a little bit of a learning curve and understanding what you're doing and how you're building things in, trying to figure out the impedance of these coils and the converting from you know this to this and, and figuring that out. It takes a little bit of time. But at the end of the day, I can sit here and I can say, all right, at 3.91 megahertz, you know, my impedance is 50.12 ohms, not much reactance, very fairly low reactance. So that's a pretty good you know match right there. If I put 100 0.4 watts into the system, that's a 1.01 SWR. So I'm saying, where what are the load losses at residence? Remember, all of that stuff can change as, as the frequencies change. But the 40 meter elements were full sized, 80 meter elements are half sized to match that length. If you look, the two loads that are on there, they're each, they're each consuming about 7.6 watts of power. So you've got about 1.3 amps of current running through them. They've got some voltage on them. Right when you're transmitting on on that frequency, they get a little bit of voltage. But they don't have a lot of current, and you, you do lose about seven and a half watts per coil at 100 watts. So your total loss is about 0.7 dB. I looked at that and I said, you know what? I mean, yeah, 15 watts is is power, but 0.7 dB at the end of the day, how much are you really going to notice that on your S meter? Not too much. And so it worked out. It was a good compromise. So what does it cover? Um, that dot is Portage County. That's where I live now. There's two circles on that map. There's 200 miles and 300 miles. So for me, 300 miles covers all of Ohio. Ohio is here. That's all of Ohio, most of Pennsylvania. I can almost get over to Philadelphia. 200 miles gets me almost to Harrisburg, gets me most of Pennsylvania or Ohio, gets me Dayton, not quite Cincinnati. And what I'm actually finding on this with these two things, this is a difference, you know, in band sometimes between summer and winter. In the winter, I can hear guys in Harrisburg, and as as the summer comes along, it starts that line starts creeping, and then it ends up about here. So pretty much anybody in this range, I can pretty consistently hit. 
works really well for our MCOM for our uh, Pennsylvania folks. That's where I was an EC in our county. Pretty much anywhere in Pennsylvania, 200 miles gets you to Harrisburg. And Harrisburg is where fee, the Pima uh, office is. And that's where like the main emergency response comes from. So all of our local stuff can go to a NVIS and get to Harrisburg. And that was the great part. That's what I said. HF nets on Saturday and Sunday, you know, really show this to be fairly reliable every week. I mean, I, people in Pittsburgh, I can talk to them. Pretty much I could get on the radio. If you were in Pittsburgh, we could talk. To them. There are times when you get really bad storms that it messes the whole ionosphere up. And that's a different story, but very reliable overall. Two antennas I have here, I've got my NVIS antenna and I've got a 6B TV. That 6B TV is set as a more of a DX type antenna. It's, it's for getting out further. It's that lower takeoff angle. It's a vertical noise levels are different. Uh, so I, I played around on FT8. I was listening to different stations and I was watching them going back and forth on the radio. So here's one uh, about 400 miles out. So this is down into Virginia from where I am, 411 miles. On the NVIS, my signal uh, that I got from that, that I could hear was negative three. On the BTV, it was a one. So that's, that BTV is reaching out a little further than the NVIS was. So here's one. This was, what's that say? 430 miles. Kind of the same thing. Not a lot of difference. Got an eight on the NVIS. The BTV was running about a 10. A little bit better. Here's where some, it kind of changes quite a bit now, right? We're going over here. We've got 4,000 miles. On the BTV, I was at negative 16. The NVIS barely heard him, right? Negative 24 is, I think, the limit of FT8. He, he, he decoded them. It decoded that, that packet. But man, it was right there at the bottom of what it could hear. Still works, right? I mean, I made a contact tuned the NVIS antenna on 20 meters one day because I didn't have the BTV up. And I talked to somebody down in the Caribbean just because I knew somebody was down there and I wanted to talk to him. Wasn't a great signal report, but I was able to talk to him. So it's not saying that this is the, this only works for NVIS, but it's definitely better close in. I was listening to a net up in uh, up in Michigan somewhere on 80 meters, and it's about 271 miles. So it's kind of right in that sweet spot when I said between two and 300 miles, and it was right in between it. I'll play the video. Hopefully, you can kind of see the difference of of what it was showing, and hopefully, it shows up. Hopefully, you guys will be able to hear the sound. I think I did that right. So I paused some certain points in here. With that net, I just switched back and forth between the antennas. So you can see here on the NVIS, I was almost 20 over S9. And on the BTV, I was about 10 dB lower. Still heard them both. They still worked, but the NVIS definitely will pull in some of those stations that you might not hear uh, on, on a vertical or something like that. So here is the um, 271 miles. This was the BTV. And, you know, just barely peeking over S9. And then when we go to the NVIS, I mean, he's definitely, he's definitely peeking out there almost 10, 12 over. So 18, I it creeped out almost at one point I did get an 18. So that's kind of how that works out there. It's kind of neat to see. It's, it's neat to just be able to A, B antennas sometimes and see how they're going and what they can do. So that was pretty much the presentation. You guys have any questions?